Church of the Apostles, a Wednesday Word for August the 28th, 2024. Today we're going to talk about turning the hearts of the fathers. And that's the title. Uh, I felt burdened to talk about fatherlessness. Uh, we've taken a recent turn towards talking about things that directly hit home with, with the everyday person. But before we dig into the innards of fatherlessness, do you have our usual endorsements? Thank you for watching. Uh, please like, share. If you have a prayer request, leave a comment below. If you're on Facebook, please follow and share. Um, any, any engagement that we get helps the ministry and helps the church, uh, helps to spread the message. Uh, also, in the description uh, of this video should be a, either a link to our website or a link to Tithely, where you can get to Tithely through the website. Uh, yes, it, it, on most of the social media, it will simply be a link to the page on the website where you can pay through Tithely. Now, on the website itself, where the video is, there is a button, but I can't host that button elsewhere so there's so a button there if you if you feel led by the Holy Spirit to bless uh, our church uh, with a donation that that's a means if you do so yes uh, and we like all engagement even if you want to call and tell us you hate us that still helps our engagement online uh, we would rather you say you love us, but if you want to say we're about your despicable scumbags, that will help us in the algorithm. Uh, all joking aside, uh, turning the hearts of the fathers, uh, we're going to go through a discussion that's going to begin with some statistics about fatherlessness, then some statistics about the factors that cause it, and then we're going to finish by uh, discussing what the Bible has to say about the subject and what we can do about fatherlessness. Uh, so with, with that in mind, I'm going to go to our very first slide here, which is uh, that fatherlessness triggers poverty. And on all these slides here, if you look at the very top, and if it's hard to read on the video on the church website, there's a PDF that will have that. And all these links I'm going to put in the description uh, where people can actually look up these sources. Uh, we, we've seen that uh, children who grow up in, and, and we can see this in this graphic, children that grow up with both parents are far less likely, dramatically far less likely, to themselves as an adult uh, live, be impoverished. Uh, fatherlessness creates a cycle uh, of poverty, a generational cycle. And as we see there, it's not close, it's dramatic. Uh, or dramatic. The, the, the most recent date on this is 2011, and you've got 10.9% uh, of children born as of 2011, uh, that were born to uh, two families or, or two two parent household, only ten point nine uh, were were in poverty, while almost 40, half almost half forty seven point six. I'm sure it is above that now. Yeah. Um, of children born to uh, a single mother. Yes, uh, and uh, I don't have uh, statistics for single mothers because we're focusing on fatherlessness. But a pretty common pattern is that you'll have any given statistic, it will, the optimal mark will be here, two parent families, always the best, almost always the best. And then you have families with single fathers, which is only 5%, but we're starting to get some data on that 5%. And a, fa a, fa a family with a single father might just be just a little shy of the two parent, but then the single mother family, it's right. way down here. And I just want to put out something so that single mothers out there don't get triggered. The quality of the mothering of the single mother is irrelevant to these statistics. It is well, not entirely fact. irrelevant, but it's mostly it, irrelevant. It, it's, it's that a mother, mm -hmm. a woman can be an amazing mother, but if she's a single mother, 
she's going to struggle. And there's certain things that, for instance, she's not going to be able to teach a son. The condition of it is the problem, not her performance in it. That's the problem. So I just wanted to get that out there. It's not an indictment saying that single mothers are performing less. You could be the best mother on the planet and still struggle because of the constraints that apply to single motherhood versus fatherhood. And we're going to talk about why the Bible gives us some insights why that why that is a little bit later, but right now we're going through these statistics, and I just wanted to put that caveat so that nobody is thinking that they're being indicted or that the finger of blame is being pointed. We're not blaming, we're simply analyzing so the data for... The reason we're addressing the dysfunction of fatherlessness is, is simply because of this. It is a biblical topic, mm-hmm. uh, and we do have scripture at the end of this, but the relationship of a father to his children mirrors the relationship of God to all of humanity. And that's one reason why fathers are supported, a very important reason why fathers are so important. At, at the same time that we've seen the divorcing of fathers from the home, right, uh, we've seen society divorce God from the public square. And that's not an accident. It's not an accident. Uh, I have some other graphics there. They're not here, but I downloaded a graphic a while back, and it was talking about the decline uh, of Christianity and religious fervor, and there is a direct correlation between that and fatherlessness. Yeah, uh, something we said, uh, you and I were talking about, was something like 90 to 95%, maybe more, maybe less, but around there, of all of our nation's social issues, stem from fatherlessness and we're either directly or indirectly we don't have enough time to cover every single issue exhaustively so i picked certain issues right. just to kind of give the general idea and if this is a first one it's a big one uh it's one that hit home for me because uh of course this is 2001 but if you were to go back years earlier uh i would have been one of the blue statistics my mom divorced my dad and I lived in a single mother home. She was a very good mother, but there were things she simply could not do. And I became this rebellious preteen. And the only thing that saved me from some of the dark statistics that I'm mentioning is that the gospel came in and I got saved and knew the Lord as my savior. Otherwise, I could have been one of the young men that we're going to talk about in a few minutes who went to jail. I'm trying to imagine in my mind that had you gone down a different route at age 12-ish, whatever, and instead you had, you know, tattoos and a shaved head and a Harley Davidson and... Uh, it's hard to imagine it's now. It's hard to imagine you, if you had you gone down that route. I don't know. I don't think I could picture well, it that way. Let's just say that I was running wild in the neighborhood, and that was boys and girls. I was probably within weeks of my first sexual encounter at the age of 12, had I not got saved. But once I got saved, that whole trajectory just went out the window. I ended up moving out of that trailer park. That trailer park's not even there anymore. It's, it's where the, we talked about U-Haul, U-Haul, the U-Haul, U-Haul is there now in Jeffersonville. Yeah. But years ago, there was a trailer park that was known as a slum land called Shady Terrace. And it was a shady place in more yeah. ways than one. Uh, ran with the wrong crowd there. Uh, I probably, there was this girl I was interested in. We probably would have done some sexual things, but the Lord turned my life around and I went a different direction. And so it was years later before I went down that road. Uh, I, and I was an adult when I went down that road. I didn't end up being among the many who had their first sexual encounter as a, a child. And we're going to go yeah. to that statistic here in a few minutes. Praise God for the, the yeah. power of Christ to yeah. uh, make us. Christ new. saved me from uh, some of the consequences of fatherlessness. Let's go through, you know, 8 to 39. It's an average of 4 to 1. If you Uh, You're four times more likely to be in poverty as a child if you have a female-headed household versus two parents. That's what happens when the father is taken out. Uh, Another statistic, fatherlessness triggers sexual promiscuity. And so they have a sample here. They've broken it down into three 
category is always absent means the father's not there at all partially absent i'm going to guess that means that he's a weekend dad and then always present means a father is a resident in the home uh the, the total numbers uh 696 percent of ch uh, kids have sexual intercourse before they reach adulthood uh, when the father's always absent. If he's around somewhat, it goes down a few points, but not much, to 63%. But then if the father's always present, if he lives in the home, it's half. It goes from always, uh, just look at uh, uh, the percentage, <laughs> the percentage line here. 69.6, 6, uh, always absent, uh, to 63.3, if partially absent. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a drop. But it's it's cut in half if the when the father, father is living always with, present. When he's living with them. They partially absent, most likely he's referring to fathers that are weekend dads. You see dad on the weekend and, and the rest of the time. And the ratio flips here from yeah. uh, you know, around sixty to seventy percent down to about thirty yeah. percent for no. And then here it's around thirty yeah. percent for yes and about and nearly yeah. seventy percent for no. So um, here's the thing. Premarital sex, uh, particularly when it results in teenage pregnancies, contributes to that generational cycle of poverty and fatherlessness, -ness, right? So, and it becomes a kind of a doom loop in a community. Yes. Uh, and we see here when you break it down by females and males, the males are more promiscuous, but only slightly. It's not, we have this uh, idea that these men are, are, they used to call them rakes, but they're, they were whoremongers that just were going around. And you have some that are that way, but the, when you look at the total percentages, it's just slightly so. 70% uh, of males compared to 68.5% of girls. Uh, but the same overall pattern is there. It goes down a little bit if the father's around on the weekends. If the father lives in the home, it's cut in half. It does drop more for girls than it yeah. does for boys. And there's other literature that says that daughters feel the effects of fatherlessness more acutely. And both of these promiscuities uh, can set the stage where fatherlessness creates more fatherlessness because as we're going to see in some of the later slides, there's going to be an increase in unwed mothers and an increase in absent fathers. I think I would disagree. <laughs> that girls feel it more acutely it affects fatherlessness affects boys and girls differently my feels I'm talking about their emotional state versus well, a lot of boys I, I'll give an example here you, you get a girl she gets molested at 12 by her teacher a boy gets molested by another teacher at 12 same day uh, the girl becomes acutely aware that she's violated acts out immediately she may get help she may not get help now the boy will go home boasting that he had a conquest of the teacher thinking that he uh, won something he was affected just as much but he didn't know he didn't know he was a victim and then when he's in his 20s he gets married he can't be intimate and they go to counseling and then this becomes revealed in counseling all of that happened when you were well, boys who grow up with ab absent father, absent a father, um, they oftentimes will fall behind in developing emotional control and emotional maturity. Um, they're more likely to lash out in anger and rage during conflict because they're not taught that more stoic um, uh, response to conflict that a father can teach their son right um, young men, uh, boys who grow up to be young men absent a father do not have that strong unless it's like a grandfather or an uncle typically are not going to have at least not from their father that uh, positive strong masculine role model that they would have from their father and, and so toxic masculinity and so boys it, boys yeah. who grow up with absent a father they're either going to be um, they're going to overcompensate right um, 
and but they're going to be emotional, uh, particularly with anger um, and violent. Uh, they're far more likely, and we know this statistically, far more likely to get involved in uh, drugs and alcohol, criminal activity, to end up as juvenile delinquents and later in prison. Far more likely. We, we have some statistics on prison, but the anger component, which right. we see more in boys. Now, girls, uh, a lot of girls will end up seeking right. uh, sexual affection to replace right. the hole that right. was left from so, the father being absent. Exactly. So. Boys and girls, I'm not going to say, I'm not saying that boys are affected more than girls. I'm saying boys and girls are affected differently by fatherlessness. Um, because, I mean, we can also talk about how a, a girl growing up absent a father, how that affects her, right? Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, one of the very common things is to uh, equate sexual intercourse with affection and which is why you see a slightly and they, and they become steeper curve with the females because that's one area where uh, girls absent the father try to remedy that they, they, they try to replace that the absence of that love with what they think is is that love and also there's a tendency and I don't know what percentage is it's probably actually less than 20 percent maybe I don't know but where girls who grow up absent a father instead latch onto older men. That, that is a thing, that is a phenomenon. They, they tend to date men that are the same age group as their father. I, I actually have a family member um, who does that. Um, she is literally chasing after a man twice her age. And um, God bless him. He's he's not taking advantage of the situation. He's be you know he's kind or whatever, but he's he's not um, crossed the line, right? He's not taking uh, taking her for granted or taking advantage of her in any way. He's like, look, I'll be your friend, but and uh, she's obsessed with him. She just she's madly in love with him, and he's like, I'll be your friend. I've had the conversation with her about, you know, well, you know, there's never going to be anything there. And if you want <clears throat> to find a mutual love and get married and all of this, mm -hmm. you, you need to start looking at someone that's closer to your age, right? It doesn't have to be your exact age, but not in 30 years your senior. You run into life stage problems when it's that yeah. much. Uh, and, of course, we're talking about differences here. But I just want to point out before we go to the next slide, the differences are nuanced. You don't see huge differences between the males and the females, but the big difference is between the father absent and the father present. Right. And uh, the difference between the weekend and nothing is a little bit, but the difference between the weekend and the father being uh, with you 24-7 is, is a huge difference. It is, yes. Uh, there, there's more. Uh, consequences to fatherlessness here and this is just a couple of statistics about social economic failure of course this can you know bubble into uh, all sorts of other things but we're, we're going to look at two of them one is the percentage of young men who graduate from college at ages 28 to 34 based on father they're about three times as likely to graduate yeah. from college if they grow up with their biological father in the home yes and they're about twice as likely um, to end up being lazy or idle uh, or are otherwise not unproductive, um, lacking motivation yes. and, and drive if they grow up without a father. They use the term idle, which simply means they're not working, they're not in school. And the study that I pulled that from suggested that one big group of them is just at home playing video games. Yes. And there's another group that's out with uh, drug addictions or some other substance abuse problem, and that's why they're high. We had a conversation last week. Um, uh, I'm going to say it was a private conversation in that it wasn't filmed, but it was here at church. You and I, after church, I think, we were talking about this. And it had to do with... Um, a video that I had seen of um, Liz Wheeler, mm -hmm. um, and God bless her, um, 
but she doesn't quite get it. And it, and it really points to a big problem that what you just said relates to uh, regarding video games. And so it seems that many women today don't understand men and don't want to understand men and don't care to understand men, right? And also she was equating the worst aspects of playing video games, such as someone who lives at home with their parents into their 40s, lives in the basement, plays video games, and at best works a part-time job, right? That, that dynamic. Now, yes, that is toxic, but someone who plays a, a video game for two hours at a time for maybe three times a week, that's no different than watching three movies a week. You've described the anatomy of how stereotypes before. People would get pieces. Right. They may have gotten uh, something like that, but they didn't truly understand the graphics, so they just figured, well, men that play video games are lazy, and right. so if the man's playing video games, they figure he's not husband material, even if the guy makes a six digits uh, salary and he just unwinds for an hour a night, there's no difference between that man and the guy who's 45 years old, still living at home, plays video games and he might work some part-time job somewhere and he's still living at home with his parents and, and nothing to show for it. Those are actually very different scenarios, but because she right. didn't understand a statistic, she formed this stereotype of uh, men playing video games are failures. So if it's okay in the evenings, after work, after everything has been done around the house, to, to watch a movie for two hours or to watch a couple episodes of a TV show, or three or four, whatever, right? Then there should be no problem playing a video game for a couple hours. If you can spend two hours watching a movie and that's fine, playing a video game for two hours it's, should equally be It's fine. just a, a way to unwind. Of course, I was never much of a video game person. Sister right. Anne's had more experience playing video games than, than so, me, <laughs> but, the, but everyone has their ways that they, they unwind from, from the stress of the day. The part that Liz Wheeler's not understanding, and so many women don't understand this. And, and us men are not really that complicated, right? So, and this, we're actually biologically hardwired to for these emotional needs, and that is things over people, mm -hmm. right? I, and this has been yeah. observed in studies, even with infants, right? Uh, infant girls, faces over things. Infant boys, things over over faces but even us men gravitate more towards engineering yeah. or uh, mechanical stuff rather than the social sciences right the stem field science technology engineering mathematics are overwhelmingly male and not because they discriminate against women boys are, are drawn to those types drawn, of things right um, and the, the second one is competition in with video games, you're either in competition with yourself, with with the game, uh, or with other players, right? We're just, especially young men, right? Like young, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old men, that's that prime war fighting years, right? Competition. War fighting and prime war dying years, when right? There's a war. And then the third is, which you talked about, is decompression. Us men, we can go hard, work ourselves, you know, blood, sweat, and tears and everything. But there's a point where we need to go just decompress, right? It's not uncommon for a man that, say, works 12 hour, hard 12-hour days to come home and sit in his truck in the driveway for 30 minutes before he goes in the house, right? Or the worn out husband or father who walks in and the first thing he does is grab something out of the fridge to drink, right? Whatever that is. Yeah. And sits in his chair and doesn't say a word for 30 minutes, right? Because as men, we need to decompress. And part of that decompression is separating ourselves mentally and emotionally from whatever the stress those stressors are, right? That's part of decompression. You and know why some men do it outside the house? Because they can't find that piece inside. Because they can't find the piece at home. And, and that's absolutely right. So video games, men who do play video games, and I, and I mean it in moderation, they're fulfilling those three emotional yeah. needs, right? Um, now, it isn't to say that video games are the only way that men 
can receive those needs, but it's, it's something that young men are drawn to, it's a game, right? And can then carry into adulthood, right? Um, anything, anything can be detrimental absent moderation. Yeah, uh, unwinding for a couple hours is different, and I actually knew of somebody that, that did this. Uh, he's one of those kind who's idle. Uh, he might work a part-time job somewhere, he may not, I don't know. I've lost track of him, but uh, it was between divorce, seeing my first wife because she committed adultery. Uh, for a couple of years, I was a single father, and I had a friend of mine as a roommate who helped me with the boys uh, before I married Sister Ann. And for a while, we, we had this other guy that hung out with us quite a bit. He didn't live with us, but he spent lots of time there. He was staying away from his dad because his dad was on him. But he would spend eight hours, ten hours a day playing video games. See, that's excessive. It's excessive yeah. to play video games that many hours per day, uh, particularly if you're an adult. I told my friend, no wonder he's not going anywhere, no wonder his dad's getting on to him. So, I mean, if, if you're playing video games th that, that much, that excessively, because time is finite, whether yeah. you're talking about a lifespan or in a given day, right? Uh, you're gonna sleep for, what, six to eight hours, yeah. right? Um, then there's work, and then there's eating. And you know, and, you know, all these other things his you have life to do. Was aimed, his life was not aimed anywhere. Video games if became all you, his life. If all you do is play video games, you're not you're not going to build uh, relationships. You're not going to enrich relationships. You're not you're not developing life experiences and new life skills. Yeah. And the only thing you have to show for it is what a leaderboard on various video games that literally no one cares about. Yeah, he, it wasn't, he wasn't incre improving himself, it wasn't building yeah. a family, it wasn't building a business, and it certainly wasn't advancing the kingdom of God because at the right. end there was nothing. It was just zeros and ones. Right. Because that's all a video game is, when you break it down to its nuts and bolts, it's zeros and ones. So I don't, I mean I play video games, but I don't really play video games. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, every once in a while I'll play for an hour. It's not even a daily thing, not even a weekly thing. People have to hound me to play a video game, and really? I only play the older ones. I'm, I might play Dig Dug or one of the older ones. The newer ones, I just don't. I've got Risk for yeah. PS2, PlayStation 2. They're already on like what PS5. Like I'm not even into the modern. The, the stuff. newer ones, uh, it, it, it's probably just because I I, yeah. I I have a motor disability. I've learned to overcome it so that. In everyday life, nobody even knows. But on the right. video game, and you've got like six or seven controls. Uh -huh. I on the newer games, I have a hard time. So I never really got into yeah. that. That wasn't a way to unwind. That that sure. was a way Stressful. to become more stressed. Right. Uh, so I do. I did other things to unwind. But back in the old the old joysticks, where right. you just had a stick and a button, uh, I could go sure. to town on Dig that. Dug. And <laughs> I might play Dig Dug every once in a while, but. Right. Video games was never really my thing. I used to play Pac-Man and Donkey Kong way back in the day, but even then, when I was a kid, I, I didn't devote a lot of time. I had other things that... So here's, a, here's another aspect of this, too, and why I've been saying, anytime I've talked about this exact conversation, um, why I ultimately end up saying this. Women, as well as our society as a whole, should be praising God that these men, young men, who, ha who, who have nothing going for them, who are um, see no financial future for themselves, no romantic future, no future, that what they're doing is playing video games. Because the alternative can be summed up in the old Russian proverb, men who have no place in the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. So video games allow them to burn the village down virtually and avoid physically burning. Well, they the can decompress, yeah. they can have the competition, they can have a feeling of a sense of purpose. Yeah. That's another thing men need, a sense of purpose. Um, uh, they can earn the play online, mm -hmm. um, a sense of feeling respect from their peers, other gamers, right? They can get that. Um, Apps, if those same men 
a hundred years ago, you'd have a revolution. Yeah. The very circumstances that we have in society right now, absent modern technology, we would have already had a revolution. Yeah. And those are the men that the, all of the various isms that's beyond the scope of this discussion, but we've talked about them before, right. whether it be Marxism, National Socialism, Fascism, they exploit men who have nothing to, because they're, they're useful tools yeah. and if a bunch of them get killed, then it's no, uh, of no consequence. Uh, but it will forward their uh, agenda, so it's it's a no-lose situation for the tyrant and a no-win situation for these men who think they have nothing to lose. So while I'm not telling young men to go out and play video games or to play video games excessively, um, and I do play maybe a game of Risk on PS2 every once in a while, uh, like, it's not... At that degree, right? Something that is done in moderation every once in a while is fine. It's when it becomes excessive. It's when it forces him into idleness yes. that it becomes a problem, yes. right? Um, young men should be incentivized, and I think there are incentives for young men to do better, right? We're, we're to overcome their situations. Here's. Here's something that should be encouraging, is that every man has the ability to overcome the circumstances of their birth and their childhood. Yes. You do not have to continue in that cycle. I am living proof of that I should be where I am today, mm -hmm. based on my uh, yeah. what I grew up in. I grew up uh, uh, between the ages of birth and nine, a toxic father. Yeah. And from nine on, uh, uh, from 9 to 12 and uh, partially absent father and then for after 12 totally absent because he died uh, the Lord saved me and the Lord uh, led me into a different path and then at various points he brought men into my life to mentor me so that I could be something else I should be in much worse shape than I am today uh, and of course one of the things I learned is not to blame situations for where I am. Not that situations don't have anything to do with it, but I was gonna to resolve to do everything I could. That way, if I failed, then it won't be because I cooked my own goose that I could say I did everything I could and stand before God and said, Lord, I did everything I could with, with what I was given. Right. Uh, and of course, the idle men don't have that. Many of them don't have a sense of purpose uh, and Part of the lack of purpose is the fatherlessness, and of course, solving that uh, can help restore a sense of purpose. So, also a thing that a father teaches their son is time management, right? And this goes into the whole idleness and and excessively uh, playing video games or excessively doing anything. A father teaches their son time management. Um, a father teaches their son moderation. Um, a father teaches their son the value of hard work and the value of respect. Time is an equalizer because no matter whether you're rich, poor, black, white, we all have the same amount of time in, in a day. I, I, at times I have thought this, my level of maturity and wisdom that I have at 45, 50 years ago, would would it, would it would that have been something that would have been more commonly seen as someone that's 25 or 30? I would say if you were to go back 100 years ago, the average 18-year-old has about the same maturity as a 40-something today. Really? And part of it was simply one component was life was harder. Was the harder. other component was is that with very, very rare exceptions, there were two parents in the home. And if one of them was missing, it was because they died. Yeah. And Which actually, that wasn't uncommon either. Yeah. Though, right? And the other thing, communities were stronger. Yes. Families were stronger. Communities were stronger. This is why in the Great Depression, people came together. If we have another Great Depression, people aren't going to come together. We're, we're going to see America fall apart. Yeah, it'll be bad. We're gonna, the stupid will do stupider. It won't, there won't be this coming together 
Uh, and part of it is that families were strong then, local communities were strong, both of them are weak now. It's all about big government and we're going to in a few minutes get to why that's a big deal. But let's get to a couple of other statistics here to round out uh, fatherlessness uh, and socioeconomic failure. Uh, this is in psychology today. Uh, this in the next slide. Uh, and we find out here in this article, 71% of high school dropouts are fatherless. That's a big number. 85% of felons are fatherless. fatherless. So, we, so if we solve that problem, we can clear out the prison. Promiscuity and teen pregnancy, yeah. which creates cyclical uh, uh, generational cycles of, of poverty children, and children of fatherlessness create fatherless homes. Drug and alcohol abuse, homelessness, 85% yeah. of felons yeah. are fatherless. 90% of 95% of runaways are fatherless. Yeah. We're, we're just touching that this isn't the whole picture we're painting. We're just giving you a few examples of the impact right. of fatherlessness. The example here is that children who grow up absent a father statistically will suffer. Yeah. And, and dramatically so. We're talking 95%, 85%, 75%. <laughs> just for those And three. that suffering has consequences to future generations. Yes. If you drop out of high school, you're less likely to be productive. And if you are productive, it's more likely to be a, a low-wage job or a part-time job where while you may be working, you're effectively idle because it's not a job that you can build a career, a household on. It's The wages are just too low. The hours are too unstable. Uh, when I was in my mid-20s, I started out working a restaurant job, and I realized if I want something more stable, I had to get out of the restaurants because it was unstable, you know, I'd work, I'd say, I want a full-time job, they'd work you 35 hours for a couple of weeks and then you'd be down to, to 10, 15, 20 hours. You can't build a family on, on that kind of a job. Yeah, no. uh, but if you're a high school dropout, guess what you're gonna be? I mean, you don't have much options. 85% uh, of felons are fatherless. Probably the number one issue there is anger. Yes, anger and lack of emotional control um, um, a lot of men are in prison because they couldn't control their anger. In, in, in the heat of, of anger, they killed somebody or they uh, engaged in battery or something. But that and, also touches on mental illness because yeah. um, a figure I had seen, I think it was somewhere really close to that. It was about 80%, I think, of uh, felons in prison, male, talking male mm -hmm. offenders, male felons. About eighty, around eighty percent, um, are actually uh, clinically uh, either a sociopath or a narcissist. They're somewhere on the cluster B personality disorder, which directly um, is resulted from childhood traumas. Right, not having a father could cause right. errors in cognitive development. It abs, it absolutely does. And, and from that comes lack of emotional regulation. I I'm wondering, and I don't have the statistics here, but just anecdotally, I'm wondering what percentage of sexual predation emerges from having either a toxic father or, or fatherlessness that rather high. So one figure we do not have here is that, it, because we're not talking about abuse, but um, both physical and sexual abuse are dramatically far more likely to occur when a child either grows up absent a father or by a stepfather. A stepfather is far more likely to abuse the children in the home than the, uh, the biological. And stepfathers don't become an issue unless there's fatherlessness preceding right. the stepfather being there as the stepfather. Right. Also, um, there was a study done with uh, amongst mm -hmm. Uh, incarcerated sex offenders and they ask well what do you look for and they pay more attention to what's uh, is is there a father in the home uh, is he a strong father right they were they would say and almost yeah. universally that if there was a the biological father is in the home and he is str a strong man like he's a legitimate threat 
that they will leave that child. Strong as in physically strong or just mentally strong that they know. Mentally, this, physically, yeah. this is a father that will protect that will his stand up to that them. will stand up and protect his children. They are far more likely to just <laughs> leave like turn their attention somewhere else. I know of an example of this that hit fairly close to home. Uh, he was a neighbor of Robbie's uncle and I found out he was on the sex offender registry and he would go and he was trying to start conversations with Robbie, with Mikey, and there was a couple of other neighbor boys that this guy was, was trying to, uh, when I found out, I did the only, this is the only time in my life I did anything that might be considered terroristic threatening. I don't like threatening people, but I told this uncle, I said, you tell him that if he touches my boys, that I will, and I can't, I can't say what I said here. I'm not going to say it over the air, but it was very graphic. Very graphic. So uh, he left them alone, and I told them don't hang around. He left them alone. The other boys, he bribed the parents. And the boys had, they lived with their mother, and then the father figure was a stepfather. They all just looked away, took the money, and he ended up violating them. Yeah, so sex offenders will target children who uh, live in broken homes, uh, particularly broken homes absent a father. Now, sometimes it may be that there's a stepfather in the home who is a good man and strong and protective, and, and that's enough, but typically they're going to be targeting father, fatherless children or children of weak and, and, you know, weak fathers. They're not going to be concerned about a guy who's got noodle arms and a pencil neck and just hangs out in his basement. Uh, the physically strong guy, obviously, but even the guy who's not so big, if they know that guy's going to be fighting them every step of the way, they'll find an easier target. Right. Most criminals are that way. Not all criminals, but most of them. Most criminals, way. most criminals are cowards, yeah. and they're going to take the least amount of risk as possible. In this case, this guy went after the children of the other family because they was an easy pick, and easy? and he he got to them. Wow. Sadly, he got to them. Wood chipper. Uh, now we're going to here's the last one here and I don't want to go down too many rabbit holes here uh, the, the author of the article that I got the statistics he says the following quote given the fact that these and other social problems correlate more strongly with fatherlessness than with any other factors surpassing race social class and poverty Father absent may well be the most critical social issue of our time. In fatherless America, David Blankenhorn calls the crisis of fatherless children the most destructive trend of our generation. A recent British report from the University of Birmingham, Dad and Me, confirms Blankenhorn's claims, concluding that the need for a father to be on an epidemic scale and father deficit should be treated as a public health issue Amen. Uh, so uh, I concur with that and we have a lot of problems that are treated in other ways and I don't want to go down because I notice he says surpassing race I don't want to go too deep into the racial thing there's others uh, eminently more qualified than us to discuss uh, the interests of those uh, both in, in their skill set and from the perspectives that they bring to the table in having those discussions. Fatherlessness is experienced across every demographic, as some demographics yeah. more than others, <laughs> but ultimately the solution is the same. Yes, uh, and the, the only reason I'm bringing it up is that there is a meta-narrative that's out there that says that racism is the root of all evil, that everything that is wrong can be explained in terms of race. The research debunks that, and in fact, if you're going to have a meta-narrative through which we see oppression and understand why oppression exists, fatherlessness is the closest thing to a meta-narrative. And of course, we're going to get to some of the contributing causes of fatherlessness, but the meta-narrative is, is I believe that there are some powerful people at the state level that want to weaken families uh, because a strong family uh, is a bulwark against a slide to statism. And as the family has gotten weaker in the United States and Europe, 
uh, churches have also gotten weaker uh, with religious affiliation getting weaker because that's also that's another statistic that's tied to that uh, single parent homes are less likely to be devout for, for there's God. something that's happened yeah. in the church as well and many many uh, probably the vast majority of American churches is that feminine um, virtues uh, or, or I should say feminine, feminine nature is being portrayed as a virtue and masculinity as a as a as, as a detriment, something to avoid. And this is why so many young men in American churches today uh, they struggle. Uh, you know, they, they come to Christ and they start going to church, and they, they they struggle because their biblical masculinity isn't taught in many of our churches, right? It, it, and maybe really get, you yeah. get weak, effeminate men who rise to positions of authority in the church, who then promote weak and effeminate men, including some effeminate enough that at one point they would have been kicked out of the church. Right. So the American church does not appeal to young men in the way that it used to. Um, and that, that's sad because, you know, women are far more likely to come into the faith than men. But if you get a man come into the faith and genuinely, he will be more on fire than uh, most of the women that will be coming in. Because a, a man, once something gets a hold of him, he will get a hold of it with everything he's, he's got. Uh, biblical masculinity, biblical masculinity, yeah. is both strong and courageous, but loving and caring, right? To be a man, biblically speaking, is to be a kind and loving husband and father and a fierce defender of his family, faith, and community when called. You'd be on. strong and assertive without being a jerk. Right, right. And so... Uh, we're going to go on from this to look at the contributing factors, but the the narrative uh, is closer to fatherlessness, and the big winner in the, in the decline of fathers is the state. And that's why the criminal justice system is rigged against fathers so much. Uh, it's not because the data supports the policy, the data uh, un equivocally uh, right. is against it but because it's in the state's interest to weaken families uh, because then the state becomes more important and, and this is why the welfare state has stepped in because if you're taking fathers out of the home then suddenly oh we need to have the state involved and so you have the welfare state you have the social workers and all this and suddenly the state has its nose in all sorts of things that it, it shouldn't need to, but if you take the father out of the home, then there's there's no other yeah. road to travel. So with that in mind, let's go into some of the contributing factors here. Uh, one of them is, of course, the divorce rate just skyrocketing. And uh, the first graphic is the number of divorces. Mm -hmm. This graphic becomes misleading after 1990. So it does, and the reason is because this is showing the divorce rate, but not the marriage rate. Yeah. So you can't have, you know, a couple can't get divorced if they don't get married. And right now... So the, the separations the, could be much more because more people are shacking up. That, right. That's one bias. It's far, it, far more. Yeah. It, 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 There's another bias that's internal just to this. California, after 1990, statistics for California weren't counted, and California is about 20% of the national population, so that's a huge California, number. California, Indiana, Louisiana, and Oklahoma no longer reported. So that actually could account for... Yeah. There's that. probably... It's probably up here. It's probably actually. way up. But the, the marriage rate... <laughs> well, see, we can look at, at uh, the percentages of marriage. If, if you look at marriages as a whole, half of marriages yeah. end in divorce. Yeah. But it's actually much worse than that. Because that that's not because we, cohabiting couples. Because you got your cohabiting couples, right. So uh, the 70% of marriages... That, that end in divorce, it is the woman that files for divorce, right? Yeah. But people don't just get married once and then get divorced and then 
never get married again. I mean, that Some does time. happen, but yeah. typically no, right? So there's a there second are serial marriage. divorces. So there's a second marriage and then a divorce, and a third marriage and a divorce. And what we have found is statistically, the the likelihood of divorce following the dissolution of a first marriage, it exponentially goes up with each marriage and divorce. So by the time you get to say the fourth marriage or the fifth marriage, the likelihood that that marriage is going to end in divorce is almost an absolute certainty. You're looking at like a 98, 99%. What I'm about to say, I'm saying clinically, and I'll let you chime in on the biblical aspect here, but clinically, if you're in, out in the marketplace and somebody's been divorced twice, then, then don't. From a clinical standpoint, they recommend don't marry them. Use very severe caution. Uh, the Bible standard is a little stricter than that depending on why they got divorced. If you get an unbiblical divorce, then one divorce is enough to not marry them. Right, so if someone has been married and they're now divorced, you have to look at the circumstances of that divorce, whether they can even remarry at all. Um, if they're divorced because their spouse was unfaithful and committed adultery, which resulted in divorce, then they can remarry. And that's pretty much it. So if Joe Snuffy and Joe and Jill Snuffy got divorced um, just because they were bored, there was no infidelity. They just, eh, I want to do something else now. Um, neither of them can, re can biblically remarry. Neither of them. Of course, we know a lot of them do remarry, but then, you know, where the clinical standard comes in is after two, three divorces, the percentage is so high that you're effectively setting right. yourself up to be divorced. When I say exponentially, I mean, it goes from like 50% to like 70%, from 70% to like 90%, right? And that's only at three divorces, mm -hmm. right? Like you're at 90% after three divorces. So... <sighs> And so marriage, marriage is no longer a religious institution in the United States, culturally speaking. While yes, we affirm marriage is, a, is established by God, ordained by God, and it absolutely should be a religious institution because it is. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until like five seconds ago, hyperbole, you know, really about a hundred years ago. Uh, a little over 100 years ago here in the United States. Up until that point, it was entirely a religious institution. The, the state got involved in marriage due to racism. To prevent interracial marriages. That's the whole reason why we had marriage certificates in the United States. Why the state has any say-so whatsoever over marriage is because 120 years ago, however long it was, uh, in the Re His, historically, marriage was viewed as a sacrament of God, as right. an ordinance of God, separate from the right. state. And the biblical basis for this is Genesis: God ordains marriage before there is any state. We don't hear mention of right. uh, ordaining of states until Genesis nine six, where it says, "Whosoever sheds blood by man shall his blood be shed." At that moment, then God ordained the state. But until then, there was no state, but God ordained marriage. Uh, and we're going to go to that verse where God ordained marriage here in a few minutes. But he ordained it at, at the very beginning. The moment he brought Eve to Adam, marriage was ordained. And there was no, there was no government. Adam was the government of, of, the, of the earth. So then um, with high rates of divorce and the decline of marriage as a whole, um, we're, we've seen this increase of out-of-wedlock births, which ties back into poverty. Yeah. Um, and that has dramatically gone up from 5.3% in 1960. This shows 406 Now, didn't you say you had seen I, I had seen another uh, statistic that suggests that's around 47 48% As, as of like 2018. Yeah. It's, yeah. So, so it, it's, it's almost it's, one out of every two. Right. Kids wow. is born out of wedlock. Wow. So we're almost in a doom loop on that. We almost. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get a, once a society gets above fifty percent, you're, you're, you're. If you're not in a do, do this doom loop, right, uh, that will do essentially 
lead the society uh, to collapse, uh, you soon will be. Yeah, because once will. you get past 50 percent, then there's pressure to make that new thing the norm. And people will then say, uh, this isn't, uh, the traditional family is no longer the norm. There's a whole meme war going on uh, in the political world where a certain politician is being cast as weird, uh, who, whose mannerisms would seemingly be through most of the history of the country normal, and the group of people who are doing it are parading drag queens, and they're telling us that drag queens are, are now the new norm. Once you get past a certain point in a, a projection, then this new thing is then pushed out, and the society's going to say this is actually the norm. The others abnormal. The others weird. We should we should toss it out. And, and instead of the nuclear family, where the father is well dressed and holding the Bible in his hand, you show some motley crew here, and you say that's normal. And the well dressed family is now the, the that's weird a, family. The, that's an excellent point. Um, they have flipped. Uh, well, this this has to do with uh, you know social programming. Um, even going back into the 1980s, um, there was a change in how fathers on television were portrayed. Uh, from the strong, stoic provider with wisdom for his children to the bumbling idiot, the Homer, toxic. the Homer Simpsons, yeah. the Al Bundys, the um, I mean, the list goes on, right? Um, enough to date that a series with a strong father, you would never get it past the censors. It would have to right. be in the production to, to, to have that. Well, it's been like 40 years of that programming, yeah. and I'm 45, right? So you've got multiple generations, probably yeah. three generations now, that have been propagandized into thinking that fathers yeah. and men are bumbling fools that can't and get all anything this, done without a woman yeah. by his side to, to go behind him and straighten up all of his blunders, right? And the exceptions to that have all been indie production, nothing out of Hollywood. You have the movie Courageous, which does a very good job of showing strong fathers and the consequences if a father doesn't step up to the role, what might happen if he fails to step up. Uh, the movie The Forge, which Robbie, sister Ann and I plan to see tomorrow, uh, is supposed to be in that same genre. Uh, I don't think I've heard of it. Okay, it, it's in the same cinematic universe as War Room. Only oh. the, the young lady who is mentored by the older lady, her sister has this son and her sister is a single mother. And the son is uh, on the verge of getting out of control. And so, of course, the old lady comes in, they, they get the prayer army to pray but then God brings this older black gentleman into the, the story to mentor the young man. So that's, that's what I know about it. Uh, tomorrow we're going to watch it to see. Uh, it, it, it seems to be a good movie. Yeah. It, it's an indie production. You would never see any storyline like that ever come out of Hollywood. Right. They wouldn't allow it. Uh, Hollywood's more likely to say Barbie is your father. Then. Yeah, so... At least 40 some years, 40 years of uh, ultimately by portraying men as bumbling fools and idiots and, and that has led to also a pretty common among young, young women and young ladies today is this idea that society doesn't need men. What are men good for anyway? They'll say. And the, yeah, they're actually saying that the turning point, at least anecdotally, is yeah. 50%. Once you get fast, past 50%, right. you're closing on that at turning point when society is going to say this, this new thing is the norm. The old thing is old-fashioned. It's going the way of the dinosaur. We need a ditch. So while I, I'm not saying that men are more important to, in society and in the home as wives and mothers, right, um, I'm standing against the notion that they're not needed, that men aren't needed to be fathers. The research uh, shows that they are. They absolutely are. We can see that there's a huge detriment in the lives of children um, when they grow up without a father. Um, we can see we can see the contribution that men make in building and maintaining infrastructures. 
Um, you know, if, if, if every man in America went on strike and said, you know what, I'm not going to work today, society would collapse in like 12 hours. It would. There's, there is a short video that's out there. I don't have it here, but it's showing about the contributions of men and it's focusing on like energy and like oil drilling, construction, uh, infrastructure things. That's like 95% men and most of those jobs are jobs that 95% of women could never do. You would have to be an extraordinarily physically gifted woman to, to do right. these types of careers because they are physically so demanding. And there, there's jobs on oil rigs and other men there was jobs, jobs of men on oil that rigs. even a good percentage of men would yeah. do or wouldn't be able to do. They get right. paid big money because it's so hazardous, so dangerous, and so physically demanding. The right. average man probably couldn't do it. These men were, are above average. They're, they're physically strong. Most of them look like they're bigger, like they're 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, you don't see a whole lot of little guys out on the oil rig. No, probably not. So it's uh, not saying a woman can't do it, but it would be a very... Statistically, very, yeah. statistically unlikely. It's like 95% practically, practically zero. Yeah. All right. So uh, half of out of wedlock births, and then there's one more statistic, I believe. And this is the percentage of uh, children that live with a single mother, and it's breaking down uh, here. Uh, the group, the subgroup of that that's never married. And so uh, 2010, 43.6%. You've seen it's gone up to. Uh, it's about 50% now. It's almost, in 2014, it was 48. It's probably over 50% by 2024. So more than half of the kids in single mother homes is a mother that's never married. So these are homes that there's not a father in a home and not going to be a father in a home. Right. What we've also seen recently is and there are many men who would marry, who mar have married, you know, uh, single mothers, and become a stepfather. Uh, many. I mean, I had a stepfather, right? We're seeing amongst our young men, 18 to 30, 30 to 40, many, many men that are saying, uh, no single mothers ever. You made your bed, sleep in it. I, I'm not going to pay for another man's child. I'm not going to support another man's child. So what we're seeing is many of these single mothers, these women who got married, who got pregnant out of wedlock, are going to find it dramatically far harder to find a husband because such a large swath of men in their age group will not date. A, a single mother, let alone marry her. They won't do it. So now, these young women are now, I mean, they, they, they put themselves in a situation, and this is something that our ancestors, and not by ancestors, I mean grandparents and great-grandparents, uh, knew, right? Um, if a, a young lady gets pregnant out of wedlock, it greatly, uh, 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 reduces and limits um, what her options are in life. And that's becoming ever more apparent mm -hmm. now as young men are, are, are looking at the state of dating, the state of marriage, and going, you know what, I, I'm just I, done. The pendulum is about to swing on feminism, and this is just one thread, but the other thread is allowing biological men to compete in women's spaces and one of the things I think we're going to see is a swing back to traditional roles. You're going to see parents. I know that if I raised a daughter today, I would not. I would try to dissuade her from competing in sports, steer her to other things that she wouldn't be penalized for being a woman. And it's not because of any misogyny, but it's because I want my, I would want that daughter to succeed, so I would encourage her to do things where she would have a chance to succeed. If she's going into, into women's boxing, she's not gonna succeed. She's, she will, when she reaches her peak, she will lose to a biological male because I, I think that trajectory in sports is here to say, I don't see that being reversed. I hope it gets reversed, but I don't see that being reversed. But if it's not reversed, 
it's going to reverse due to the natural dynamic. Other parents are going to say, daughter, Jane, Sally, whatever her name is, I want you to succeed in life. If you uh, go into music, if you, you could even steer a woman into a STEM field and she could succeed, but in combat sports, right. that's, uh, that's determined. Uh, an average man can be trained in, into uh, a shape equivalent to a world-class woman in a combat sport. They, they done an exhibition match. It was, I think, the United States volleyball team and they went into some high school in Texas, and this was the boys' high school. And they did an exhibition match. The boys' high school stopped them. Right. And this was the world-class, world-ranked girls' volleyball. But when they went up against high school boys, the high school boys won. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that, we've seen that. The USA uh, soccer team, um, very similar story. Yeah, they played a high school boys team, and they got just demolished. So, uh, athletically speaking, men are far more capable across the board. So, if you're a parent and you know that that's never going to change because of the powers that be, right. then you know you might steer your daughter to say, "Hey, go go into music, go uh, write a book, any of a number of things." And that will shift things back to where you're going to see more traditional roles, women doing things. And there are plenty of things out there that women do better than men. It takes strong fathers to stand up and say no. And there have been many who have, who have stood up and said no. You're not doing this. Um, and of course, I'm talking hypothetically. I never had a chance to have a daughter. All my kids were boys. But if I had a daughter growing up today, those would be some of the directions I would be steering that daughter, and not due to misogyny, but I want her to have a successful life. So, uh, and uh, we're seeing this isn't the path to a successful life here. It isn't. Uh, so, uh, wrapping up, and we're about to go into our scriptures here. But the contributors to fatherlessness, we, we see three major threads. One is, of course, divorce. We have no fault divorce. Uh, our divorce law and our family law make it easy for a woman to destroy a marriage. It's rigged against fathers. And so it, it, it's rigged towards this welfare cycle that allows for women to survive but penalizes pathways to success right it, it you become perpetually poor right. locked into this cycle if you make too much money they they penalize you rejecting marriage and that comes both for young men and young yeah. women rejecting marriage uh, young men and young women spreading their wild oats and trying to have as many life experiences as possible um, you've got um, now some millennial young ladies who spent their 20s, uh, you know, living a, a pretty decadent hedonistic lifestyle with multiple partners, and now they're in their 30s and they, they want to get married, and men don't want anything to do with them, right? Maybe they got, maybe they got kids uh, out, that they had out of wedlock, uh, or maybe they don't, but they, they're, you know, they've had all those experiences, they have all this baggage, and these these men aren't they're they're not interested in those women yeah there was a guy his he's a sociologist named Majaris. he does research on sex and of course he one of the things he talks about is market value and he says i don't like to use the term but to evaluate i have to use this term and so he talks about the market value of women the market value of men and how that plays out and of course as it plays out is that men start out with very low market value that increases through age men peak around the age of 50. Uh, women's market value starts out high uh, right out of, right out of high school it's a very high market value uh, based on looks based on sex appeal the man doesn't get it until he starts gaining wealth start showing he's responsible, getting reputation in the community. And so what happens, these women in their 30s, they start losing market value you, yeah. while the men pass them up. That market value is based on youth, beauty, and fertility, which yes. all decline with age for women. 
Yeah. Uh, while a man's market value has to do with his ability to provide and protect, which, which increases is, which increases with age, plateaus. You're right about around fifty. So around fifty, and then it declines afterwards, but it doesn't decline as fast as a woman. It doesn't really decline fast until a man's elderly, and of course. That's right now, that isn't to say that men are more valuable than women. It's it's just. That is the market value in regards to their appeal to the opposite. Yes, and, and, and he made the caveat here, we don't really like to assess market value, but if I'm going to evaluate this scientifically, I have to use these tools, and that those are the tools that he has to, to show this. A man is more attractive to a woman when he, he has more resources and more skill and ability. To I found it true in my life. Well, I struggled to to find a suitable woman. My first marriage was a dud. She was unfaithful to me. Uh, when I got separated, the, my biggest surprise, I thought I was over the hill, but evidently women didn't think I was over the hill. Uh, I, I had all kinds of women that would have never paid attention to me in my 20s, that I had their attention once they found out I was on the market. You know, and of course, my problem, I had the opposite problem, not getting a woman, but filtering out women that I shouldn't get. And the Lord led me to Sister Anna, and she was a very good choice. Faithful wife, faithful woman of God. And if I'm going off the straight and narrow, she's the one that puts me back on the straight and narrow. Uh, so I found out to be true in my own life. And of course, this leads to our last point here. We're going to talk in some of the subsequent slides a rejection of complementarianism for matriarchy. And that goes to people saying we don't need men. You know, there's, we, we hear from the left and from feminists all this ranting and raving about the patriarchy, but really the United States is more matriarchal now yeah. than it is patriarchal. And I'd, I'd argue even far more matriarchal. Um, I would argue that there's far less uh, uh, there's far less uh, oh dang on my brain's not working pray for me folks yeah uh, mis there's far more or far less misogyny hatred of women yeah. far less misogyny than there is misandry which, which is the is hatred, hatred of men. men. There's far more hatred of them. An example, this occurred in Chile, mm -hmm. and I forget what the outcome was. I think he won, yeah. but there are jurisdictions that if you are a man suing for divorce, the only feasible path to victory is to identify as a woman, and that's what this guy did in Chile. He identified as a woman, uh, had all the papers drawn up where he's now female, he said, and of course he says, I don't have any crisis of what my sexuality is. He, he's not identifying as a woman for the typical nefarious reasons, yeah, but got, his lawyer it. said this is the only way you're going to win is if you identify and you yeah. litigate as a woman. And he got custody of the kids. Yeah. He got the property. Yeah. You're, you're familiar with that story. I know the yeah. exact story, yes. Yeah. yes. Um, he would have lost had he sued as a father. Well, we know this family court is heavily biased against men. Heavily biased. The criminal justice system is heavily biased against men. There's things that just, and that's just, yeah. it is what it is. That there's nothing we can really do about it. That's just how society There is, is a contingent but, of men who will first identify as a woman, then they will tell everyone they're a lesbian. And of course, that just circles back to them being who they were, but you, you have to do this identify as game because society has rejected complementarianism, has embraced matriarchy to the point that if you want to survive, you game the system in those ways. I don't think I could do that, but I can get why some men might do that, and they're not strange men. They're navigating a strange and bizarre society. So this opens up a whole big conversation because it's like, okay, well, why are they doing this? Why, why is this even a thing? Well, it has to do with uh, tearing down and destroying the very pillars of civilization, the very pillars of faith, the very pillars of what it means to if be a man. If you destroy the organic basis for family, then family is just a construct. And if it's just a construct, then guess who reigns supreme? The state. The state. 
and that's what it's all about. It's about making the state God on earth. And I know we're not supposed to be talking about Mystery Babylon rising, but everything leads back to Babylon. Amen. So with that in mind, let us now finish our discussion here. We've got three or four scriptures here. Uh, this first one is the biblical basis for complementarianism. Pastor Chris, do you want to read Genesis sure. 26 to 27? Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we see two things here. One, God created man in his image, and that's the basis of a whole bunch of things. It's where our dignity is grounded. It's the basis that Christian thinkers later use to build uh, an apologetic for liberty. Uh, humans were meant to be free because we were created in the image of God. We have free will because we're created in the image of God. Uh, unlike animals, unlike machines, unlike rocks. Uh, the rock doesn't have a will of its own. It just acts according to whatever laws of physics are applied. But people can make choices. And it's rooted in the image of God. But notice within that, uh, you don't see any reference to distinctions of races here or distinctions of nationalities here. But we do see a distinction in gender between biological males and females. Uh, masculinity and femininity are, are, aren't just constructs. Yes, there are constructs related to that, but they it's rooted in something that organically exists that God put into the creation of man when he created man. He created man so that some of us would be masculine and others would be feminine. And that would, be, that would be the normal description of, of the human race. And they are put complementary to each other as complementary expressions of the image of God. So complementarianism is a biblical doc. It, it absolutely is. Um, God created man and woman um, to not be the same. I mean, I've, I've heard this said comically before. The, well, one thing that they love about women is they're not men, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, where if, if we laid out the the strengths and weaknesses of men and women, right, and compared them, you typically will find where where a man is strong, the woman is weak, and where the man is weak, the woman is strong. Men and women yeah, complement complement one another uh, biologically. Um, emotionally, cognitively. mentally, cognitively, right? And God's divine order for our families is likewise complementary. There are is roles for the father and husband as there is roles for the mother and wife. It's different roles. If men and women were absolutely the, the same uh, with no differences whatsoever and there's absolutely no evidence to corroborate that quite the opposite well then what's the point like this is why same-sex marriage it's not that i oppose it it's that my view is it simply does not exist now you can create a legal document declare it a marriage call it a marriage but it's not the same thing because it's not two complementaries together but two of the same thing right together so you can't have a same-sex marriage in the biblical sense that the Bible describes marriage. God defines marriage. And God defines marriage as a man and a woman. And so therefore, a quote-unquote same-sex marriage is not a marriage. And the same-sex marriage, unlike the true biblical marriage, has no organic foundation. Its only power is the decree of the state. This is rooted in something that's beyond the state that largely regulates itself. Now, there might be excesses that happen where the state has to step in if you have a man who's a toxic father or a woman who's a toxic mother and they're committing crimes against each other and the children where the state steps in. But the state doesn't need to recreate and redefine marriage. Marriage largely over the big picture will regulate itself. Same-sex marriage requires 
uh, heavy hand uh, of the state, and, and we're seeing, and this is something that several of the justices in the Obergefell decision, uh, Alito and Thomas said, this is going to open up a whole can of worms. You're going to have all these other lawsuits coming a as a result uh, of this, and, and guess what? Exactly they have. What happened, right? So any any anyone who claims, we'll say, is a pastor, I'll put that in quotation marks, a pastor who performs a same-sex marriage, a real pastor wouldn't. But someone who claims to be a pastor that, do, that, that does perform a same-sex marriage blasphemes God and his divine order. Yes. They are a blasphemer. And if, if I ever run into any such who's within a sphere where I have authority, I will move to fire him. Right. And I think we're both in agreement on it. If yes. we bring in another elder and they go there, there they will not be. They would not be an elder anymore. Yeah. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And these words which are commanded you shall be in your heart. So they're being commanded to love the Lord uh, with everything they got. And then there's some commands that are given that's supposed to be in here, the heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. So what this means is that while... They had rabbis to teach the children. One, they had priests to teach. The number one office for teaching children is the parent. We can <coughs> preach the gospel. We, we welcome kids. We'll teach kids. We have a responsibility as pastors. Yeah. But the number one responsibility for teaching children is the children's father. Amen. The father is to be the spiritual head of the home. Yeah. And that's what this is saying here, and, and it's talking about all, in, in every context here, you shall talk with them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and in your gates. So this is in every context, not just when you go to church, but that the Bible is to be taught, it's to be modeled wherever that father is, that's to be part of the entire family's lifestyle. Which sadly doesn't happen today. But that's what we are commanded to do. Teach the children. And then this one here, this is where I got the title. And this is in Malachi here. We're not going to talk a whole lot about Elijah, even though it's a prophecy about Elijah being sent. Uh, but evidently, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord's wrath, God's going to do a work that turns the hearts of the fathers to the children and of the children back to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So it's almost that Malachi, through the Holy Spirit, anticipates that there's going to be a crisis of fatherhood. And while what we've talked about today, we've focused on America, it's not just America, this is global. There has been a, a as a result of, of the uh, fatherlessness, uh, the uh, rapidly declining rate of marriage um, birth rates are plummeting and not just in the West I mean it's, it's most largely seen there but it's globally birth rates are plummeting you know, Klaus Schwab if he listens to this will be smiling from ear to ear one of those Cheshire cat grins that's this is exactly what he wants yeah. uh, that's just an aside there where this isn't about uh, the Schwabs or the World Economic it, Forum, other than the fact that they have a vested interest to weakening fathers. That's that's the only intersection between that discussion and this, is that they have a vested interest in weakening fathers because that moves things to where they want the world to be. One of the arguments I've heard it said, I, I'm saying this in jest, this is a little comical. Uh, one of the arguments I've heard said that we're either like in a movie or uh, this is a simulation is because Klaus Schwab is like the perfect movie villain. They, they've even had some where they, uh, he was, what, which I forget which movie it was, but it was that villain in, uh, and he's bald, I forget what movie it was, but it's, yeah. uh, I, maybe it's Invincibles or Minions or one of those Whatever kind of movies. Whatever it was, right, yeah. yeah. And he, he, he looks like he looks like a Hillary, Hillary Clinton dressed like it. You look at some of these world leaders, 
Some shit. of them look like Bond villains, behave yeah. like Bond villains. Yeah. They're like booby villains. Or other villains. Uh, Jeff Bezos uh, not only has like the ball clock like Lex Luthor, but he, he has a bot in one of his factories that looks like the robot that Lex Luthor uses to fight Superman. And then, of course, I can't stop, uh, stop this discussion without talking about Elon Musk being Iron Man now. And somehow he managed to get a cameo in one of the Iron Man movies yeah, really. as a friend to Tony Stark, one oh, of his tech friends. That's funny. So Elon Reeve Musk exists in the Marvel Cinematic Universe as a minor character. Wow. And of course, uh, he likens himself to Iron Man. So I guess at least in his case, he likened himself to a hero rather than rather than a villain. Uh, a villain. And then, of course, the, the Chicago mayor's office dresses like they're uh, in Gotham City, which I guess Chicago's not really that far removed from Gotham City and, and it's a zeitgeist. It's the... Funny. It's, it's funny and it's not funny because, you know, I've wondered why are all these leaders imagining themselves as these villainous characters in our fiction and then of course you watch all these movie shows it's talking about cons conspiracies and of course everyone sides into resistance with these but then you wonder why why don't they see it when it's really happening what, what we uh, talk about some film theory here in the 1990s those of you watching who are old enough to, you'll remember this I know, you and I remember this the 1990s was the decade of the anti-hero, yeah. right? So it is the good guy who pursues a good uh, goal or a good outcome, but he'll bend the rules to get there. Maybe even break them, right? What we're seeing in modern movies, characters that are central to the story who sh who are in essence the protagonists but are really a villain yeah they're casting villains as heroes and and heroes as villains and they're obscuring the anti-hero and of course most of the people that uh best fit those who might stop the apocalypse if you will or at least slow it down to put it off to the next year are really anti-heroes they're pursuing good things but they've got a checkered history i won't mention some names but uh, we can think of some names of some very wealthy famous people who have a, a lot of black marks on their record but they're standing against this slide into the new world or it's gotten so bad that people are now saying that uh the karate kid that they flipped the hero and the villain and that I've heard this. They've been talking about that for a few Daniel years. Daniel is the villain and Johnny's the hero. That's what they're I don't get it. I don't get it because Johnny was a bully. Yeah, he was a bully. Now he had a good story arc when you go into Well they created a whole TV They created a whole TV show called Cobra Kai, yeah. I believe it was called, which was built on the premise that that Johnny was the good guy. Yeah, that, uh, I, I think at first they said that he was just confused and mixed up and ended up redeeming himself. But I think they're trying to rewrite that where he was just the hero all along and Johnny was a villain and everybody misunderstood what was happening in The Karate Kid. But Johnny was a bully. Yeah, he was a bully. He was a bully who got what he deserved at the end of the movie. But if, 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 if up is down and down is up, then we shouldn't be surprised. You know, uh, we're told that a, a strong father who takes his children to church, the whole family's well-dressed, and he has his Bible. In today's pop culture, they're the weirdos. And then you have the motley crew of people dressed all sorts of ways, like the village people, and they're, they're normal. You know, uh, including the guy, you know, who, who's got a woman's eyelashes, women's makeup, going around in high heels and augmented other things and a beard. And that's, we're told that is normal. And it's pushed by people who believe that is normal, who want that to be the normal. And if you don't think it's normal, you're a bigot. 
I don't think that's normal. I'll never think that's normal. What is what is good has become evil, and what is evil has become good. And, God, and the Bible says, woe to be to those who call evil good and good evil. And that's so if we don't succeed, if the hearts of the children of fathers aren't turned to each other, then uh, the Lord's going to come strike the earth with a curse. Uh, and of course, with this is kind of left hanging here because he says he's sending Elijah, and this is what he's going to do. Uh, but then he, at the end, he kind of leaves it kind of hanging. Does he strike the earth with a curse? Because God said, if this doesn't happen, I'm going to strike the earth with a curse. So uh, is, the earth, is the earth being struck with a curse because this has not happened yet? Or is it a case where the earth is already cursed and to the degree that we can reverse this, then the curse becomes reversed and, and tides are turned? Uh, whether we change society or whether what I think is most likely to happen, society is going to be cursed, but there's going to be a community of God's people where that becomes reversed, that becomes made right in Christ Jesus. Well, that what's here is what comes before the coming of the great and dreadful yeah. day of the Lord. And of course, uh, that, that will solve all the problems. Whatever the state is, the second coming will. You know, something that I thought was really amazing recently, um, Donald Trump um, at a, I don't know if it was a rally or it was a press conference, but this is something that he said that I, I thought was be just beautifully stated. Um, and of course, he says it in a very Trump way, but that, uh, you know, nation needs a savior but you know i'm not the savior he says he says there's only one savior and he goes in to talk about how jesus christ is our savior well amen i've been amen. saying that for years that there is only one solution to this fallen world that's jesus christ we have but one savior only one savior and that's jesus christ so you hear donald trump is saying i'm not a savior i'm not going to save anything or anyone um jesus is our savior I do believe that the events of January, or excuse me, July 13th, fundamentally changed yeah. him. He talks differently now. Now he still has that sharp side that he's always had, but he's made various statements that seem to be of genuine faith. Only God knows whether he's truly saved, but I believe he's on that arc. Uh, and of course, you know, that, that would be well outside of his normal narcissistic self to say that because he's used to promoting himself. So if he's promoting somebody over himself, that, that's a big deal. That, that's a big deal. And I, I listened to that speech. That was a big deal. That was while he spoke it in a Trumpian style, he said something that you would not have expected Donald Trump. To something say. that you would hear from behind the pulpit Yeah, at church. And the sad thing is he's saying it and there's pulpits where they will not they say it. They won't say it. Yep. And so we have here one more passage here. Uh, it's in Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. What have we seen through all that statistics there? Where there's a father in a home directing his kids uh, that they prosper. Kids and fathers' homes... Uh, don't prosper and of course we haven't studied it but a child that systematically rejects the advice of a good father some of them are in that same boat as the fatherless because they've rejected their father but then there's a command given fathers do not provoke your children to wrath in other words don't do toxic masculinity but do the biblical masculinity which is but bring them up in a training and admonition of the Lord Notice here that children are commanded. Fathers are commanded. We don't see in a text a command to the mothers. So fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. That is to provoke is to intentionally incite your child to anger. To intentionally do things to enrage your child. Right? Um, it could also be viewed as intentionally doing things to harm your child. Right? So gaslighting your children would be provoking them. Would be provoking them to anger. Um, 
the, the, the be anta being antagonistic uh, to your children and calling them names would be provoking them to anger. The, the not so young man I was talking about that spends many hours on video games, his father gaslit him. He had a brother who was gaslit. Now there was a middle child that he was a completely different father to. He brought that son up in the training and admonition of the Lord. The other two were taken to church, but they had a different experience with their dad than the middle child. The middle child ended up being highly successful and in fact, he is a successful uh, position in one of the local school systems. He, he, he was successful. The Gaslit Brothers, uh, not so much. It's not uncommon for a narcissist to have a golden child that, they, they, that all their focus goes on that child and then to have another child. There's specific roles that narcissists assign to their children. Um, and one of them is basically the punching bag. Uh, the firstborn and the lastborn were the children that were never going back to nothing. That was their narrative growing up. And one of them that ended up falling short could have done great things. He was incredibly talented. And in fact, he was talented in sports. And in this sport, his senior year, he was the top athlete in this area. Could have gone to college, full ride, but it, it didn't happen. And the root of it was a toxic father. And we haven't talked much about toxic fathers in it, but a toxic father can produce the same consequences as an absent father. Right. And so the command is to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So for those of us who are fathers, this is what we can do to stem the tide against fathers is to train our children in the admonition of the Lord. They're more likely to grow up to be constructive fathers, constructive citizens. Uh, but I'm, I'm also burdened uh, of other things we might do. Uh, and one thing that's on my mind is that God raises up people to be mentors to children that are, are not their children. And sometimes he'll bring them they may come into their life with their children as a grandfather, a step-grandfather, an uncle, and they step up while that child's a child to guide that child in the right way, to be for that child things that their biological father can't do. And then other times, God will send men in to mentor young men uh, who don't have that guidance. And that's one thing that the Lord did with me is on two occasions, he sent men into my life I don't know why both of them had to be named Ray, but that's, that's, that's how that worked out. He liked to send men named Ray into my life to, to mentor me. One mentored me in, in the ways of the ministry. The other mentored me in ways that could help me be a better father to, to my children. And I owe both men uh, a, a debt for what they did. But God will sometimes call on you to be that mentor into the life of people who don't have that. So did you have any comments about mentorship or, or maybe experiences in that area? Or it, it is important for men to step up, and we have seen this. Um, this was down, I think, in Louisiana several years ago. Um, there was a, a lot of uh, uh, truancy and, and violence in this specific school. Uh, it, was a, it was a high school. And uh, a group of the of the community of the neighborhood fathers came together and would go to school. They would go to their 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 child's school, but they weren't there just for their kids. They were there. At, of course, it was orchestrated with the school, but they were there to provide themselves as a positive role. Uh, role model to the all the kids, specifically the kids that didn't have fathers, and truancy dramatically fell. Um, fighting at school dramatically fell. Um, these fathers were spending uh, time not just with their children, but with the children of their community. And this is just an, an example of how men can make a difference in the lives of their community, not just their family, but their community. 
It is important yeah. that men be men. Yes. Biblical men. Loving, caring men. Men that can provide, men that can protect, men that can guide and teach. Men that will be, in essence, pillars of their community uh, and in their church. Um, and I, I don't mean pushover, weak, doormat men. I mean biblically masculine. Yes. Uh, and back to the, mood, the two big movies about it. Courageous it was focused on uh, calling on men to step up to be the fathers that they needed to be. The Forge looks like it's going to be more on the mentorship of a man, not the father, stepping into a young man's life to be his mentor. I'm remembered of a Christian movie I saw. This movie was probably from about 10, 12 years ago with uh, Kevin Sorbo. And it was a what if, I think was the name of the movie. Yeah, he had a movie called What If. And uh, the premise here is that he had, at the very beginning, um, you know, he's like, oh, I'll be back or whatever. He leaves. But he never goes back. And instead of going out on mission and, and doing things with the woman, this woman that he loved, instead of marrying her, he went and had this amazing career. And for whatever reason, he's on his way back to the town he grew up in and his car breaks down. And um, the what if is, when he's brought into town, uh, and the, the tow truck driver is an angel, it's supposed to be an yeah. angel. But it's the, it's the what if, it's had he stayed instead of getting on that bus, right? Had he pursued and married her, and right? And so in this what if scenario, like, He's, he's a pastor. He's they're married and they've got a you know mm -hmm. I, I want to say a gaggle of kids, but it probably wasn't a gaggle. But it was several kids, right? And it was a beautiful life. He, he, instead of having the penthouse and millions of dollars, he had something that was far more valuable, which was a loving wife and family and a purpose and a role in the community and as a leader in the church as the pastor. Um, and he spent a good portion of this movie trying to get back to his old life, but he realized at the end that that's what he wanted. That's what he wanted. I remember watching that movie, and then at the end of the movie, he sees the angel with his wife, and she, again, she's going through her what if to, so that they get back to where they need to be. And of course, life is full of those what ifs. Yeah, at the, at the end, they, they were together. Yeah. And it was supposed to be like years later, and they had built that very family that was the what if. Yeah. Society needs strong, healthy families. And to have strong, healthy families, we need strong and healthy men and women. And strong and healthy men and women are raised by strong families. Yeah. And it may, t it may mean that uncles and grandfathers and grandmothers and aunts and cousins, you know, we have to come together in, in extended families to help when there is a family member whose father passed away or disappeared or there was, you know, for whatever reason, this child doesn't have a father. Well, this, this is the importance of having not just a strong nuclear family, but an extended family. Yeah. Because in that instance, and what historically would be a very tiny percentage of where you have um, a child out of wedlock or an orphaned child or you know, a widow and her children, there would be an extended family that could help. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and our society not only has they, have they done away with the extended family structure, that was the industrial revolution that put the nail in the coffin on that. Now we have the destruction of the nuclear family well underway. And we need family. Um, the health of a society can be directly measured by the health and, and uh, of its families. And so the, the, their end game is people who feel soulless in the 15 minute cities that own nothing, they're happy. Uh, and they're not really happy, but uh, they're happy because the state tells them they're happy. They would dare not say that they're unhappy. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, I call that dystopia. So with that in mind, anything else before we close out? I don't have anything else. Okay. Heavenly Father, we come right now in the name of Jesus, and, and, and Lord, we ask that you just motivate the fathers here in us to step up to be the fathers, that you would motivate the men who are here in us who might be in a position to step up to be mentors to uh, children or young men whose fathers are not able to play that role to be mentors to them, to, to guide them just as you brought men into my life to guide me to do the things that my dad was not able to do, that you would raise uh, us up to be able to do that. And Father, we know that this will take time to build, but Father, we ask that with this a revival of fatherhood build and then the, uh, we can see revival in the church. We pray all this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.